it's only the second time ever on the Baker Rares you've had two thumbs up. <laughs> the thing about Fenton's Abbey is... Airwolf. It's the, the licky... Like, licky... No, I can't say that. You're going to have to edit that. <laughs> everybody intervention no everybody no listen i've got currently got seven pairs of socks on the needles how many did you have on the needles yesterday eight oh, it's filming this way you're fine you're fine it's filming this side <laughs> are you you're joking Everybody to the Bakery Bears video show featuring the rise and fall of the monasteries. Ooh, and it is sort of lovely. the last time I can say that because next time it'll it's be the, just the fall of the monasteries. So, really, I suppose, oh, it's all wrong. The whole series has been the rise of the monasteries. I was going to say, yeah, you've said it wrong the whole time, if that's the case. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. We go back to the beginning and start <laughs> again. No, 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 that's silly. I'm being pedantic. Yes, it is the penultimate episode of The Rise and Fall of the Monasteries, but did you see the outtakes? Because yes, <gasps> it has happened. <laughs> this was amazing. I suppose it was always going to happen one day, but as you saw from my reaction, I was quite surprised. <laughs> yes, part way through, I'd literally just hit, as you saw, I'd hit record, on a shot that I was taking, and suddenly from the corner of my eye, there appears two wonderful people all the way from Maryland, and they were viewers. Yeah. But not only were they viewers, they were walking around Fountains Abbey, watching as they walked. And listening to Dan. Walking in my footsteps, which was the most humbling experience of my life. I'm and like, then they walk around a corner and there he is. <laughs> I can't even imagine how that must have felt. <laughs> well, they were just the, the loveliest people and it was an absolute, you know, it's just wonderful, wonderful to meet them. And I hope, yeah. go back and watch that outtake yeah, again. Yeah, watch it again. Because that shows you how I would react if you came up to me and said hello. And what that tells you is, whilst I may be quite shy and a little bit private, I'm always very happy always to meet you. Always say yours. hello, absolutely. So uh, yeah, I wasn't there, unfortunately, because I don't go with Dan when he does his filming. I was really, you know, he texted me straight away and I was like, oh, I'm really sorry I wasn't there because I would have loved to, to have just been there and experienced that. It must have been so cool. And what a great episode we have in store. Yes. Because it is our second part of our journey around Fountains Abbey mm -hmm. and it's totally unlike any episode you've seen it's, all it series. It is. I... I thoroughly enjoyed it do make sure you keep your eyes on the screen especially towards the end because dan does something he's never done before in the sort of post-production of it and it's just amazing so rise of all the monasteries coming later on the show but we are like right in self-striping september <gasps> we are and actually we're getting towards the end of I september know. i can't Crazy. believe we're almost at the end of september that's absolute madness isn't it it's gone so quick this month but yes self-striping september is still going on i'm going to show you an update on my stripey socks but the ravelry thread is huge now you know there's so many people been joining in it's they all want the wonderful prizes fantastic. game I know, and I do have the prizes over there. Should I show them quickly? No, show them at the end. I'll show the prizes at the end. Yes. But look, we may be nearing the end of September, yes. but have you felt a disturbance in the force? Because, yes, we are, over the years, we've become renowned for our advent calendar, but oh. December is months away. This year, as you may recall, we decided to add a little bit of the advent calendar sparkle to our summer of stitching. Mm. And you guys seem to love, love it. it. So mm. we thought, why don't we do the same thing with Soccerween? Oh, it's our next big event and it, it rolls straight on after the self-striping September cal. Mm -hmm. Runs all the way through October. Yeah. And how would you like to see a little bit of what's to come? of October. 
October is almost upon us and that means it's nearly time for our Soccerween event. There is a special community knit along, lots of exclusive Soccerween content and so much more. What if sock knitting frightens you more than things that go bump in the night? Fear not, because throughout October we'll be publishing a brand new absolute beginner sock knitting course, so you can join in too. Welcome everybody to the start of a tutorial series on how to knit a sock. Welcome back everybody to part three. So I'll get going on the decreases and then I'll tell you what the tiny adjustment is. Whether you're a sock knitting demon or an absolute beginner, we've got you covered this soccer week. So we will see you from the 1st to the 31st of October 2023 for all of the spooky fun. My goodness. How fun is that? How exciting. So exciting. I will actually be casting on some Soccerween socks. Yes. And I'm going to show you the yarn that we're both going to be knitting in Soccerween in Endy Bits. Look, yeah. too much, way, way too much excitement for the start of the show. I know. Soccerween and oh, meeting lovely can't viewers wait for and can't prizes wait. and oh my goodness. So look, less of that and more of. Kay Jones, what's on your needles? Oh my goodness, well, what I needed for this next project is a little mountain of things right here. Yeah. And, and it's super cute. You see, th that mountain was causing me to want to get to this. Wait till you see I know. what you're going to see. Yes, and this all stemmed from this next project. So it's a pair of socks and I didn't show you these last time, did I? I don't think I did. Maybe I showed you the yarn. I can't even remember. But I, I don't know whether I've shown you these before. But it's a pair of socks for Bryony. And I saw this yarn recently. And I just thought, oh, I've got to knit some socks for Bryony in that yarn. Because the theme of it is something that she loves and adores. So the yarn I'm using is from Helen at Giddy Yarns. And it's in the colourway Poo Sticks. She's got a whole range of yarns that are Pooh Bear themed. I think there was, there might have been Eeyore, Tigger, I think. And there was a Pooh Bear one, which was that sort of golden -y Pooh Bear colour. But this one, this colour just grabbed me because it's very autumnal and just looks super pretty. And I've never knit with Helen's yarn before, not that I can recall, and certainly not a pair of socks. So I wound it up, which was a task in itself with my current ball winder. It keeps eating yarn. I need to do something about that. But I've discovered if I wind it in a certain direction, so if on my swift, if the yarn's coming off from the right-hand side, it always winds pretty well. If it's coming off from the left-hand side, it's a disaster. So I always make sure now that I'm pulling from the right hand side and it seems to be okay. But this colourway, let me show you the yarn. Oh, isn't it lovely? It's a mixture of like forest green, there's golds in there, there's purple, and there's a little bit of sort of peachy colour that I've seen as I've been knitting it. It's so pretty and really autumnal, I felt. And this yarn is a variegated, so I, I didn't know how it was going to knit up. And we all know that variegated yarns can knit up in different ways. But I started knitting them. I thought, I really like how it's knitting up. And I made the decision, I'm on the foot now, and I made the decision not to use a contrast colour for the heel. I thought, I'm just going to use 
this yarn. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to let it do whatever it wants to do. So I knew when I got to the heel and the gusset and everything that there'd probably be a little bit of pooling going on. And there is a little bit. But then, you know, I get back to the foot and it's it's lovely again. And do you know what? I, I really don't mind it. So here's the sock. Where am I up to? Oh, it's really lovely. I love how it knits up here on the leg. And then, yeah, we do have a bit of naughtiness going on there around the gusset. But then the foot is really nice again. And I'm just really enjoying knitting with the yarn. And I'm finding that I don't mind that bit of pooliness on the heel. I can't imagine that I'm changing entirely into someone that doesn't care if it pulls or not. Because this is just a little bit, isn't it? And I think the thing with these socks is it's what the yarn is. You know, it's Pooh Bear themed. So for me, I don't mind what it does because it's Pooh Bear. And Pooh Bear, Pooh Bear is, a bit, is a bit crazy, isn't he? So I absolutely don't mind what this yarn does. And I'm just really, really enjoying knitting these socks. I've just done a plain vanilla sock, which I don't often do these days, but I'm just loving the fact that it's just a plain vanilla sock. It's so nice. I've really, really enjoyed it. I tried a different heel turn with this one. I normally just stick to the heel turn that's in all of my patterns, which, well, I use two different heel turns in my patterns. One is a French turn, which is more of a triangle. And one is a Dutch heel or a square heel. And that is as it sounds. It's like a square square shape. But for this one, I, I tried a heel that it's a bit more pointy. The triangle is a bit more pointy than on mine. And I'm not mad about it. I'll, I'll carry on and knit it with the other sock. I don't know if you can see there. But it's quite pointy, the triangle. And I prefer it where it's a bit flatter on the top here because I just think your heel, if you look at the shape of your heel, it doesn't go to a point, does it? It's, it's very rounded at the top. So I think that's why I prefer a bit of a flatter top. But I think it's always nice to change things up, isn't it? And have a bit of an experiment. So I'll do the other sock the same. And I'm just really loving them. And I'm knitting these on, well, I started knitting these on the Adi Calibris and I actually changed the needles. Now I know that you're not supposed to do that part way through a project, this can affect the gauge. But I've had a wrist issue the past few days. I somehow managed to sort of slightly sprain my wrist. It's a lot better now. Knitting with wooden needles I find is way better. So I changed these to higher, higher bamboo because these are my favorites and they're much it's much better and it might have just changed the way that the stitch the way that the yarn is knitting up a little bit but so be it you know it means that i can knit these comfortably without any pain and that's a plus for me so what i decided to do when i got this yarn is i thought right okay well Bryony's pooh bear has to have a new pair of socks doesn't he and he needs poo sticks socks now, historically, Pooh Bear, who I've got here, you can see, look, hello, here I am. I'm not going to show you my socks, look, he's keeping them secret. But historically, he always wore a pair of socks that I knit years ago, which were these. <laughs> They're looking really scratty now, and these are knit from Opal, because I thought they were sort of Pooh Bear colours. And these socks are knitted to the pattern that comes in one of my toy designs, one of my, um, do we call them toys? What do we call them? It's a toy, isn't it? And it comes in this design. This is Fitzwilliam Fox, hello. Named after Mr. Darcy from Pride and Prejudice. And can you see his socks? Because he's a fox in socks, so he had to have socks. So my, the original ones for Pooh Bear are knit exactly like these, which are a really heavily modified sock. There's no heel turn because I discovered that Mr. Fox's feet don't need a heel turn. And he's got a very wide foot, so it's made to accommodate that as well. So Pooh Bear socks never really fit him very well. They were a bit big. So I decided I would modify that sock design to see if I could get a better fit because Pooh Bear's feet are smaller. And look, oh, can you see his little socks? Here he is. Look how cute. His legs are very floppy these days. He's a very old bear, look. He's very, very old and loved, but his socks are just perfect. Can you see? I'll take one off in a second and show you. So they look really peculiar off his foot. 
but they fit in perfectly. So look, here's one of them. But how cute is that little sock? So I used the pattern that's in Mr. Fitzwilliam Fox, but I modified it because his foot is so tiny. And look, Pooh's got plasters on him. Oh, I hate, oh, I can't even look at it. It's really bad, isn't it? Putting plasters onto soft toys because getting them off is a nightmare. But that's what Bryony did when she was little. She put plasters all over them and I never thought to stop her really. She wanted to do it. Anyway, he's now got his really super smart socks. So they're gonna, him and Bryony are gonna have matching socks. How cute is that? So he's very, very happy. He's a very happy bear. So that just got me thinking about the other toy designs that I've done in the past. And it occurred to me that I, I don't really talk about these anymore. I haven't spoke about any toy designs that I've done historically in the past. And I thought it might be fun just to show you the ones that I have designed and the patterns that are out there available. Because this is where everything started with the Bakery Bears, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, everything started with Mrs. Bakery Bear. Here she is. This is the original Mrs. Bakery Bear. And she looks great. So this was the first design and these little toys, soft toys I will call them, are all of the pieces are knitting round but then you do seam everything together but the patterns have like a, a full range of photo tutorials showing you exactly what to do. So that was Mrs Bakery Bear and then of course Mr Bakery Bear had to follow and there he is with his smart stripy trousers, he looks a bit nautical and he's got a little cabled jumper. So the the bodies themselves are knit using, I think these are Cascade 220, so it's like a DK worsted weight for the bodies. And then the clothes are, these are a DK weight. This is, both of these actually, all of these are King Cole bamboo cotton. I really love that yarn. It wears incredibly well. So that was Mr. and Mrs. Bakery Bear. And, oh, and I've got a tiny one here. Look, I did a fingering weight, Mrs. Bakery Bear. I've got dozens of these things upstairs. I just took a few out this morning. So here's a fingering weight, Mrs. Bakery Bear. And she's super small and cute. And then after Mr. and Mrs. Bakery Bear came Miss Gelato Giraffe. And Miss Gelato Giraffe is inspired by... Bryony's Goffy Giraffe. You've all probably heard us talk about Goffy over the years. So here is Miss Gelato Giraffe. She's looking a bit squished because I pulled her off the shelf this morning. And these colours are inspired by Bryony's Goffy. And she has a cute giraffe tail. And this yarn also I think was Cascade 220 but it was a variegated that they did. I don't know that they do these anymore. And she has a lovely cardigan, which is done in fingering weight. This is Cascade Heritage, I believe. So there she is. And then we've got another one here. And it loads of these drafts because I love them so much. This yarn is Dancing Dog Dye Works. I mean, Michelle's yarn was just the best yarn for, for toys. And I've actually still got a skein of this yarn in the skein because she sent me a couple and it's called, this is Obi-Wan Knitter, isn't it? Hmm. Just fantastic. So there's another giraffe. And I've also got a fingering weight one. <laughs> you can see I've knit so, so many toys in the past. So I just thought it might be fun to quickly go through those. And just, you know, show them off. Because, like I say, I never really talk about those designs that I did all those years ago. And I think that's quite fun just to have a little look at them. So, all stemmed from a pair of socks for poo. I know. Amazing. So all of that came about because I was knitting a pair of socks for Pooh Bear. Oh, he's so happy. When I put these on him this morning, he looked at me and just like gave me a big smile. The thing is, Pooh Bear's really special because he was a gift to Bryony when she was born from her godfather. And he's literally been with her every single day of her life. You know, literally he's right there all the time. And that's just so special, isn't it? Because he carries all of those memories. And he's so loved. He's all, like, loved looking. And still, oh, he's not... a pair of socks. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so happy to, to, you know, I was just so thrilled with, to make them. It only took me a couple of hours, you know. Just such a happy little project. So, Dan Jones. Yes. 
what's on your needles. Well, it's the last time you'll see. It's the Quantock hat. And it's the reason why the last time you'll see it is because I'm about to finish it. Oh. I had to show it to you again because I've just been loving the decreases. They look marvellous. Mm. And size-wise, as you may recall, I spoke a little bit about the wind sheaf and yes. how the sizing didn't come out quite right. Well, this one, Kay tried it on, and it's the perfect size yeah. for Nano Wendy. And I've enjoyed knitting this hat so much. It was the plan always anyway, but I'm going to cast on another another one with the other two yarns. And then there's so many combinations, because mm. there's four different skeins, so you can combine them up. And yeah, absolutely. I can have months of fun. I know, I know. Because there's, there's also loads of yarn left, which is really tons great. Tons and tons of yarn. It barely used Feed any yarn. Feed a brook farm yarns. And it just knits up so lovely. Yeah. You know, this, it does look like a sunset, doesn't it? Over the mountains. Quantock Hat, because that's where my mum's from. Yes. So it's, uh, and they're lovely hills, actually, the Quantock Hills. They are lovely hills. They're really great to walk because there's no, like, massive ones. No, they're quite gentle. You're never going to get scared with heights in the Quantocks. Mm, mm. And it comes, my mum has spent a lot of time in the Quantocks, so it's the perfect gift, mm. really. Fantastic hat. Yes. It's really beautiful, and that'll be finished in no time, won't it? Well, yeah, in, in two rounds. <laughs> I can't so believe you didn't finish it. I shall be showing it to you in a few weeks, finished off. Oh, I love. Because Kay's got a whole stream of, of what's off your needles on the way, which is very exciting. Oh, yeah. I've, oh, Intervention. Everybody. Intervention. Right. No, everybody. No, listen, I've got currently got seven pairs of socks on the needles. How many did you have on the needles yesterday? Eight. And I've, so I finished a pair that I'm going to show you later, but... Excuse me? I, Did that... Oh, Pooh Bear socks. So that was nine. Nine, <laughs> if I count Pooh Bear socks. <laughs> it's just absolutely crazy. I don't know how it's happened, but it, I've got to do something about it. So I'm going to be spending the next couple of weeks getting as many pairs of those off the needles as I can because I really want to enjoy Sockerween, you know, and I don't want to keep thinking, oh... Got four other pairs that I should be knitting. To be fair, if I have, you know, if I manage to get three pairs off the needles, I'll be more comfortable. So we'll see what happens. But I love the colour that's coming next in this skein. Look at that. Yeah, Is of that course, I finished beautiful? that skein. Yeah, I know, but... So that'll be the next time I knit with it. We'll next see that. time you knit with it. So it is gorgeous. This might be the brim of the hat next time. That'll be just beautiful, won't it? Well, it's it, so fun, this yarn. It is. It's really fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, I couldn't... I, couldn't I do it. think a lot of it feels more like a sport weight, though, than a DK. That's OK. It's kind of a little bit thick and thin, isn't it? It's a bit like hand hand spun. What's nice about it is it feels really nice. It does feel really super lovely. So I think it's, it's not BFL. too sort of bitty. You know, sometimes let like, like Lopi can feel a bit like. Oh, Ooh. yeah, no, no, no. This is BFL, so BFL is quite a smooth yarn, isn't it? It's super smooth. Yeah. And, you know, it's quite silky. Yeah, and that's just tremendous to work with, isn't it? You can't beat that, to be it's honest. Lovely. That's like my perfect type of yarn to work with. Oh, that's very I mean, I do autumnal, love working with that Lopi, but. Very autumnal. Beautiful. So, two really great skeins of yarn, but I'm going to be using the other two skeins for the next hat. Yes, because yes. you so, want to see what how those colours. Because yes. then you can, once you've got all four of them wound up, you can then decide, looking at them, which two you're going to choose. For then for the third the project one. after that. <laughs> yeah. And who knows what that may be. Yes. But yeah, Quantock Hat, just a lovely project. Really happy now that my DPN technique, you know, it's been a great journey for me going from the windsheaf through the body of that learnt lots reminding myself of what I need to do to keep it nice and, and looking lovely mm. and then through this one I've had no problems whatsoever so adjustments made and that's all really great so it served the purpose that I wanted it to serve which was mm. to get my DPN technique back up to where it was mm. so that's all really good what else is on your needles well because of the aforementioned Massive number of socks that I've got on the go at the moment. Today I'm going to be showing you a trilogy of socks. So the second in that trilogy, this pair you've seen before, but I've, I've almost finished the pair. So these are my pop socks. If you remember these from the last time I showed you, I told you how that name came about. I don't know if I have had one finished last time I showed you. Maybe I'd finished one and I'd just cast on the second, but I've almost finished the second now. 
So here is the first one. Oh, isn't it lovely in those colours? I'm keeping them in this bag and look how it matches really lovely. This is one of my very, very favourite bags from Emma at Moo and Mouse. I use this all year. It's a Halloween bag, but I use it all year round. I love it. But these socks, can you see at the colour change here? They've got a little sort of pop of colour, if you like. These two colours just randomly happened together. I just pulled them out of my stash to use to swatch something and just thought they looked so lovely together, I was going to have to knit a pair of socks. So I thought I'd do stripy socks, but I wanted to do something at the colour change. And I accidentally came up with this little sort of texture pattern thinking it was something I'd already done on a previous pair of socks, but I hadn't. I checked all of the designs that use that I've done that use a sort of similar thing. None of them were like exactly like this. So I thought, brilliant. I Because I've enjoyed it so much, I'm going to put this out as a platinum pattern next year. That then has led me on to thinking about what I'm going to do for the two patterns after these. So these are the pop socks because when I was sketching out how I was going to do the striping sequence I put P-O-P-O -P -O for pink and orange and when I looked at it it spelt out pop and then it <laughs> then I was like oh my goodness we do a pop a pop show is our patron only podcast. And as you've mentioned it the next patron only show is coming on Sunday the 24th of September at 2 p.m. British summertime. It's the last one this year at British summertime. And it's a special wow. one because we'll be talking all about in detail our upcoming soccer week oh, event. Oh, that's this Sunday, isn't it? Yes. Wow, that's this Sunday. That's exciting. I love I love filming pop. It's so fun. So yeah, when I realised that these socks were Bakery Bear themed, that gave me the, an idea and I'll tell you about that in a second. But here's the second sock. I'm on the foot and I've got two more stripes to do and then the toe. So I'm really not far away at all. So here's where I'm up to. So I've done heel flap and a square turn with these. And what I really like is that I decided to run that orange colour into the heel flap. And I think that looks so cool. It, it kind of, it balances everything, but it also just makes it look like the stripes continue, doesn't it, down the sock. And I really love that. So I'll, I'll be, you know, that'll be written into the pattern. And what you can do with this, and I'll, I'll write details again in the pattern, is that you can alter the width of these stripes to make it so that the foot length is right for you. So all you need to, to know to do that is how many rounds is in your foot, you know, from the back of your heel here to the tip of your toe. So you can, sorry, not the tip of your toe, the start of your toe. And once you know that, how many rounds that is, you can then figure out how to fit in your stripes, you know, just by doing a bit of maths. So I'll include details of that in the pattern too. So yeah, my idea that sprung from these socks, so these socks, the pop socks, will be a design on the 1st of March next year. And then the two designs following that, so the 1st of June and the 1st of September, will also be socks. And we're gonna have the pop socks. It's then gonna be followed by the Endy Bits socks which are going to be a scrappy pair of socks. They'll be in June. And then in September, we're going to have the waffle socks because we always talk about waffling. So how exciting is that? Um, and I've already, I've already figured out what I'm going to be doing design-wise for one of those other ones. So I've just got to work on the other. So and, and I just love, when I thought of that, I thought, oh my goodness, we're going to have a whole year of Bakery Bear themed designs. We've never done that before. So I thought, why not? How cool is that? So yeah, the pop socks are almost finished and I love this pink and orange combination. I don't know whether Bryony's going to like it. You know, I'll see if she likes it. She might do and she might want these. If not, then I'll just have them happily. So yeah, I'm going to get these ones finished up and, you know, I'll be another pair off my needles, but I'm using these pink needles. Can you remember I spoke about these last time? They're wooden. 
and I got these to knit some Barbie socks, but they were exactly the same colour as the Barbie yarn, so I didn't end up doing that. But I actually quite like them now. I wasn't keen when I first started knitting with them. So it's this brand that I just cannot say without it sounding hilarious, so I'm not even going to try. And it's the blush colour, even though they're not blush. This, this to me is blush here, the packaging. These are the needles. It's not blush, but anyway, that doesn't matter. And they're wooden. And I didn't like them when I first started knitting with them because I found them really, um, really draggy. There was a section in the middle that had a transfer with the size on it where everything stuck as it was going across the stitches just like jammed on it but as I've used them you know what happens with wooden needles and this is what I really love about them is they polish you know your stitches going up and down them and moving them around kind of polishes the wood and I don't find now that that middle section is is a bother so I do quite like these the only thing I'm not keen on is they're very very bendy my other wooden needles, the higher, higher bamboos, are not as bendy as this. They're much more of a harder type of wood. They are very bendy. So if you are someone who knits kind of really tightly or holds onto their needles quite tightly, you might find that you break these quite easily. But I've been okay. So I might use these again. So what else have you got on your needles? I definitely couldn't knit with those. No. I'd break them in. You'd break them casting on. Would I, honestly? Uh, yeah, I reckon I mean, so. it's so interesting, isn't it? The whole... Because, you know, everything has its place and sometimes looseness is good, isn't it? Dependent on... Well, it depends what you're knitting, doesn't it? You don't want a loose gauge, do you, when you're knitting socks, really? No. And if you are a loose knitter, then you find you probably just have to go down... Would you probably be golden sizes. if you were a continental knitter? Well, it, I don't know. I've, right. I, I've never knit... I've tried to knit Continental and I just couldn't do it. I've tried several times and my brain just can't do it. But in my experience with people, I, I do wonder if people who knit Continental are more likely to knit looser. Just looking at how you do how it. Because how do you tension it? Well, people tension it in different ways. You tension it, obviously, over your left hand, don't you? And some yeah. people tension it, when I've seen them knit, tension it quite tightly right but then conversely i've seen other people who don't tension it tightly when i've right. seen like stephen west for example knit he looks like he knits really loosely when he's knitting continental that might not be the case it might just be what comes across yeah. on the screen yeah. but i i kind of wonder i mean tell us in the comments if if you're a continental knitter do you knit loosely or do you not have an issue with that because I, As I of a continental knitting yeah, I mean, I, swatch I, I, challenge. <laughs> I sometimes think that as a thrower, as an English thrower, that I have more, not control, but I'm more in charge of what my tension is doing because I'm wrapping that around rather than when you pick it. I've seen, you know, when you pick that yarn, I've seen people do it quite a distance up the yarn, if you know what I mean. Also, there as well, when you... And then that, to me, When you're knitting continental, isn't loose. it more in the fingers than in the hand? Aren't yes. You? Yeah, so there's more strength. Because you're not doing that, are you? There's more strength in a hand than a finger. Yeah, maybe. Definitely. I mean, you can flick it as a, you know, as an, an English knitter. You yeah. can flick it with your right hand. And again, I don't do that. I have tried it, yeah. but I'm just not able to do that. And I, you know, that is another technique. There's so many techniques, isn't there? And whatever works for you um, is great. Whatever works for you works for just you. Just interesting, it? isn't it? Yeah, but certainly if you're knitting socks, you you don't want a loose a loose gauge, do you? So if you are a loose knitter, I would think you'd have to go down. A needle size from when what was stated in a pattern. I tell you what would be cool to see. Example. Take a hundred. In, yeah. How do we knit throwers? We, we're throwers. We're English style knitters. Take a hundred yeah. throwers, and measure yeah. their. Yeah, yeah. Do us everybody do a swatch take with the same needles and the same yarn. Take a hundred continental, continental knitters and see. I would love to do that. See who gets but the you, average. I bet everybody's gauge was different. Don't you think everybody's gauge would be different? But that's why you do a hundred. Because then you get an average. Yes, that is and true. And then you'll you see, you'd get you a would. categoric answer. That is true. Yes. Yeah, so if you did do a good sample and you'd knit exactly the same thing, same yarn, same needles, yeah. and then, yeah, averaged it out, then that would tell you, wouldn't it? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. 
Really interesting. So, look, this year I've made a bit of a mess up because it's all well and good casting on something in fingering weight. And it's going great. And I can knit it. And I've just finished the second repeat. So it's a big sort of moment about to go onto the underarms, which are steeped. So that's all fine. So there's no holes or anything uh, to deal with. But I'm going to hibernate this. And the reason being is it's just taking too much time. You know, if I was just sat, you know, happily knitting away on my sofa, then even still I might hibernate it. I don't know. Because you need to make sort of progression forwards. And if you don't make progression forwards, then sometimes before it becomes staid and boring, mm. you need to go, right, okay, I'm going to put that away for a bit. And I suppose that's the reason why people hibernate things. Mm. So maybe whether I was here with you now or whether I wasn't, maybe I still would be hibernating this and getting it back out sometime next year. Because it's fingering weight, I can knock out... I reckon I could do two let lopies in the time it would take me to do one of these. Oh, yeah, I'd say so. Maybe even slightly more, maybe two in a tiny bit. By doing this, it's still a great thing to do because I can do it. Mm. Brilliant. You know, that's great. That's beautiful. And so I've shown myself I can do it, which is really good to know. I know it's there to come back to, but I know what I like. Through doing that, it's helped me really sort of identify and hone in on the things that I like. You know, at the end of the day, I really enjoy knitting Let Lopi. Mm. I've, I've got two or three books, of those Let Lopi books, mm. full of designs. And so I'm just going to get myself a load of Let Lopi. And I'm going to, because the other great thing is about those sweaters, I've been really pushing the boundaries quite a lot with a lot of different projects. And it's just time to not do that for a bit. You know, because I can cast on a let lopey, I can knit the whole thing, no one needs to come and help me with anything, I can do it all, and so I, I'd rather just do that for yeah. a bit, knit within my comfort zone for a little bit. That's not to say so that lovely. this isn't lovely. I mean, it is, the, absolutely, it's beautiful. The design's just wonderful, it's really easy to follow, and everything about it is great, but because I'm not, you know, I'm not a fast fingering weight knitter at all, it's just, it's taking too long. So time to say goodbye to the roosty tank top well, for not, you know, maybe three or four months, yeah. sometime after Christmas. And what I want to do is I want to get the Aaron Harper Gansey finished, Yeah. get another low, let, let Lopi on. Also as well, I'm going to finish the cable and twist socks probably within a day or two. Mm. So then I, I'm ready then to cast on... For Sokoween. Sokoween. First time ever in the history of the Bakery Bears that, that I've actually that you've knit. done that. Yeah, So yeah. that's really exciting. That's really and also exciting. as well, really keen to get that other hat casted on. And it just, it's yeah. so great to have yarn that you want to see what it's going to look like knitted up. You can't do everything, can you? And, you know, you sometimes do have to little have a little bit of an assess of what, you, what you're what doing and change it up a bit if that's what you want to do. I, but it's be, beautiful. Personally, I would have... I would be happier now if I was just finishing another Let Lopey jumper. Mm. And I think that's the way to think of it. So I could either have this or I could have just finished another Let Lopey and it'd be all done. I'd rather have the Let Lopey all done. So that's what tells me, you know, time to, to put this down. I'm yeah. sure that the time will come imminently. Oh, absolutely. You want to get it back out again? Probably February, March next year when... Because, you know, it is just the, the, the sleeve bit. Yeah, and then, you've, you've done, you've sort of broken the back of it, I would say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and like I say, I couldn't recommend the pattern more. Mm. So, you know, if you're a, a garment knitter, you fancy knitting a tank top, it's the Roosty tank top, Ella Gordon, who, of course, as I told you last time, I've been emailing with, who's just so lovely, mm. and it looks gorgeous. So, it does. It, I mean, it's the nicest one I think I've seen. What else is on your needles? Well, my goodness, it's another pair of socks. <laughs> so this is my stripy socks, and excitedly, I've finished one. I've only just cast on the second, but I've finished one. So from Bryony... She is fickle, honestly, but what are kids like? So she chose this yarn and thought it was lovely in the skein. When I started knitting it, she's like, is that what it looks like? Right, okay. Added some purple in, finished this sock, and she now loves it. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop listening to her, which I think is probably a wise decision for most teenagers, isn't it? 
stop listening to her and do what I think's right. So look, look at this. Oh, I love it. Isn't it fantastic? And actually that purple, I think, is just perfect that I've added in. So this yarn is from Freckled Whimsy and it's called Spooky Kitty Remix and it stripes in an eight stripe repeat but there's five colours if that makes sense. There's the way it's sequenced, that's a word. Yeah. The way it's sequenced means that it's an eight stripe repeat but there's five colours and it's just lovely. So I've knit my fairground socks pattern. <laughs> Shock horror <laughs> because I just love it. For me now knitting these socks it's almost like, it kind of is like knitting a vanilla pair because I know the pattern so well. But it's even better than that because it just looks so amazing, I think, with self-striping. It's just the perfect pattern with self-striping. I absolutely love it. And I think it looks great with these colours. They're so poppy, aren't they, and vibrant. So I didn't do a super long leg with these. I asked Bryony how long she wanted a leg and she said medium. So I went with... 45 maybe 40 45 something like that so a nice nice length and I've cast on the second now let me tell you for whatever reason I've only done this so it's literally cast on but I wanted to get these to match really well and I, I'm not normally fussed about that but because because I've put in a, butter, a butterfly heel here just one of my heels it's in this pattern along with the standard heel flap and gusset but because I put this in and it ended so neatly at the end of that green I thought well if I can get them to match so that it ends really neatly like it did with this one then that would be cool and I got I left I've woven in the ends on this one but I've left the starting yarn here so that I could see if they matched you know because I can see that color change there from orange to black and I must have cast this on about six times to try and get it to exactly the same point. And it's, it's close enough, I would say, because I do find that even if you get it exactly, so even if you use those skeins where it's 250 gram skeins, you know, that are exactly the same, and you start at exactly the same point, I do find that your gauge can differ a little bit. So you can ultimately still be a few stitches out by the time you get to, for example, like the, the heel. But I, you know, I've tried to match it. It's difficult to show you, but I've, I have got the same amount of black before the orange, pretty much on this one. So fingers crossed it will match well enough. And I'm using my favorite higher, higher bamboos no, they're not higher, higher bamboos. I'm talking absolute rubbish, everybody. Whenever I've said higher, higher bamboos in this episode, they're not at all. They're nitpicks sunstruck. The reason I, I've mistakenly said higher, higher bamboos is because I've been looking into wooden needles recently. And I've got myself some, I ordered some chow goo bamboos and that's where I'm getting confused. No, these are Nitpicks Sunstruck. <laughs> they're my favourite wooden needles because they're a light colour. I, I, you know, I love wooden needles, but having a dark colour, so do you know the ones, the symphonies or harmonies or whatever they're called? And they, they also do Caspians and a couple of others. They're all really dark. And where you've got dark coloured yarn, I just really struggle to see sort of comfortably when I'm not in broad daylight, you know. So that's why I prefer a pale coloured needle. So yeah, I've got sock two on the go and we've only got not very many days have we left in September and I really wanted to have this pair finished in September so that I could start another pair in for Sockoween. But we will see, I'll see how I go. But I absolutely love how this has turned out. It's so fun and bright and very... Halloweeny, so even if I don't finish it, I can carry on in Sockoween, and that'll be cool, won't it? Yeah. So Kay mentioned that we're well into September now, and that means it's autumn, isn't it? Well, no, it's not, is it? Oh. Officially, Bryony informed me on her country file calendar. She told me that it says autumn begins on. I think she said Sunday oh. or Saturday. Look. 
officially but a lot of people think as soon as we get into September it's autumn but I think technically the autumnal equinox right. is not until this weekend right well maybe that's what Hallmark is waiting for oh. before they drop all their great pumpkin themed all, films all autumn films with apples and all of that oh. business but we did manage to find one we did yes yeah I, I'm really not fun. even convinced it was on Hallmark I don't think it was I on think Hallmark. It was on Prime. It was on Prime because In we fact, couldn't Hallmark's find. Hallmark's been a positive disappointment. Hallmark's been really disappointing. I also think we get a different Hallmark to what is in America. I which... don't think we get the Hallmark that America gets. That's not right. It's not because if you're paying for it, you're paying for it. It's not fair. Anyway, I, I want the Hallmark that you all get in America. Look, time <laughs> for a recommendation for a great. Well, it depends what you call great. It depends what you class as great. Our category for Great Hallmark is not very good at all. Yes. In fact, we want them to be rubbish. Yes, we We do. want them to be formulaic. They need to last for one hour, 28 minutes and no longer. Yeah. And there needs to be a misunderstanding at some Always point. Always a here, misunderstanding. Where everyone thinks everyone else doesn't like each yeah. other. The film was called Sweet Autumn. Sweet Autumn. Oh, yes. It was most excellent. Yes. Sweet <laughs> Shop. I couldn't even say it. Sweet Shops. Sweet shops and Aunt D's candy shop. Yes. And why is it? Why is it? Uh, Kay said to me, "Why are they spelling shop S H O P P E?" Yeah. I said it's because they think it's quaint. They must do. Yes. I think that's the old English way of spelling it. It isn't is. It is. Ye well, old shoppy. Yes. Yes. But then you started researching the actors, didn't you? And oh, you I found did. out that. I the, did, I did. The male lead, he's been in loads. Yeah, he you has. See, I don't he think, has. I don't think he's a hallmark hunk. I I follow hunks of Hallmark on Instagram because why wouldn't you? Yeah, I'd highly suggest that you go and do that. It's very entertaining. But yeah, he I think he is in terms of the hunks that hunks that are on there, then I I think he's really nice actually. I think he's all right. But is they both they were both not young. Well they're never young. No, they aren't that's ever what, really young, point. are they? And that's the I point. actually really like that about Hallmark films, yes. you know. They're not always 20-somethings no. finding love for the first time. No. You know, the, the people with, like, backstories and histories and yes. lives before they meet this amazing hunk of Hallmark. Yeah. Yes, so I, I'm, I'm afraid I disagree. I did not think he was a hunk at all. <laughs> I'm trying to think who I think is a hunk I can't on remember. Hallmark. What was his name? I can't remember. I can't Andrew... Something. Oh, right. Okay. I think. But you, you'll see. If you look up the film, you'll see. Yeah. Sweet Autumn. And it, it has all the things that you would want yes. from an autumnal film. Yes. So it's got all those sort of, you know... All of the houses. Pumpkin-y business. Yes, all of the houses are like festooned with yes. pumpkins yes. and falling leaves and... I'll be honest. I think I enjoy those films more than the Christmas ones. Yeah, I really love the autumn films, which is why it's been so disappointing that we haven't got like this deluge of we watched one last themed year. films. We watched one last year where there was a solicitor with a dog, yes. with blonde hair. Yes. Now, he's a hunk of Hallmark. Oh, yes, he was. Thank you very much. Do you remember his name? No, I don't no. remember his name, but that doesn't matter. And yeah. there's a real hunk that's in them, that's in Stargate. What's his name? Yeah, he's got a funny no, name. No, no, K-Van. K- um, K-Van, Kavan Smith. No. He's he, very hunkish. No, he isn't. He is. No, no, no. The, the, no, the guy... Bri- me and Bryony have decided he's extremely hunkish. The guy from the Apple film, he he's hunkish. The well, Apple film? The one we were just speaking about. He's a solicitor with a dog... And he's like walking around and he gets that left. That wasn't an apple. Oh, no. the, the other one we're talking about. Right with the dog, yes. Yeah, th- th- there's an they apple They all farm. kind of merge, don't they? Yeah, yeah, because the, the, the stories are <laughs> essentially the same. It's essentially the same story over and over again. Yeah, which is why they're so fabulous. Yes. We enjoy the averageness of them. Yes, but the it predictability. Is... And it's so funny, we'll put one on and like the opening scene is pretty much yeah. always the same, isn't it? Yeah. You get that powerful kind woman, of... Powerful businesswoman. No, no, the very for... opening scene. Oh, yeah. You get that sweep across Wide either vista. like a city or mountains Upbeat, or a music. river. Or, yeah, or there'll be like snow and Dan will be like, oh, I love it already. Yeah. <laughs> music you think you know but actually you don't you don't because if it was the original track it would cost way too much yeah. to put in the film and of course we save we always save every year the very special Christmas Lodge for viewing I I'm don't afraid of Christmas that... Secret 
trumps a Christmas lodge. I actually bought a Christmas secret for Dan on DVD last year because he loves it so much. It's one of his favourites. A Christmas so secret is way better him. than a Christmas lodge. Well, Christmas Lodge is very, very special to me because, of course, it's got Daniel Jackson from Stargate. And he is a hunk. He is a hunk. Unlike any of the other ones that we mentioned, apart from the guy from the Apple film. But look, we've talked way too much. We have. But the whole point of bringing hunks. this up... <laughs> The whole point of bringing this up was to recommend a great autumnal, f- autumnal, a great autumnal autumn. film autumn. to you, and that is Sweet Autumn. Yes, is very good. Go watch it and think of us. So this is it. It's the penultimate episode of our great adventure that has been the rise and fall of the yes. monasteries. This time we return to Fountains Abbey to take a look at its story when it was just about to come into Mm. its last hundred years of existence. And the great thing about going to Fountains to do this is its story is pretty much the same for all the other places that we visited. So the broader sort of story connections are the same. So everything that we cover in this episode, something similar happened Mm. at all the other places that we visited. So without further ado, let's enjoy. Yes, it's time for the rise and fall of the monasteries. years ago, a way of life arrived in Europe that shaped the development of the world we live in today. Healthcare and education are just two of the many innovations pioneered by the men and women of the monasteries. From the height of their powers at the time of the Normans to their total destruction at the hands of a tyrant king and a cruel emperor. This is one of the most epic stories the world has got to tell and whilst their way of life may have virtually disappeared, Everywhere you look across Europe, you'll find ruined monasteries, echoes of their fascinating existence. And in this series, I'm gonna take you to some of my absolute favorites. This is gonna be quite an adventure. Welcome to the rise and fall of the monasteries. and fall of the monasteries and our exploration of the great Cistercian monastery of Fainton's Abbey. This will actually be our final tour of an abbey site before in the next episode when we discovered the dramatic fall of the monasteries. But today we're back at Fainton's Abbey to finish off its marvellous story and my goodness are we going out in style. We're nestled in the corner, in the southeast corner actually, of the Yorkshire Dales National Park. 
and we're 52 miles southwest of Hartlepool, where this series began way back in February. We're actually just up the road from the 14th century Ripley Castle, which is a really fascinating place to go and visit. And we're also not far from the spa town of Harrogate. Neil, if I took you back 200 years, Harrogate was nothing but two tiny villages. But then everything changed when they discovered 88 natural springs. Many of those visitors stayed, and Harrogate today is home to 75,000 people. Quite the achievement, when you consider it was all thanks to the discovery of some springs. And the funny thing is, actually, if you think about it, Fountains Abbey takes its name from springs that were found here as well, so it's sort of all connected. Now, when I saw you last time, we discovered the story of the foundation of this spectacular place, from its humble beginnings as the monks who had rebelled at St. Mary's Abbey in York and come to caves which are just a stone's throw away from me now, whilst they waited to be accepted into the Cistercian Order. But accepted they were. And then, of course, we charted its rise to power and to perhaps the most successful abbey in all of England and certainly all of Europe. Quite the feat when you consider that Revo Abbey that we discovered in episode two of this series is literally just up the road. Allred would of course go on to become St. Allred and he had many books published and we've actually heard his words many times this series. The monks here at Fountains would have listened probably to readings from St. Allred as they sat and ate in their refectory, which we're gonna visit later on in this episode. But you might be wondering, what on earth are we doing back at Fountains Abbey? Well, the great thing about Fountains is the story of it at its height is sort of a microcosm of what happened at every successful abbey in the country. So by discovering the story here, we get a good understanding of what was going on in the other abbeys at their height as well. The best thing though about Fountains is there's tons and tons of written records, so we know its history better than any of the other abbeys that we visited. Now, to do that, we're gonna to need to position ourselves in history. We're gonna to need to understand what the wider world was like as the monasteries entered their last hundred years of existence. Our story starts on the 6th of December 1421 here at Windsor Castle with the birth of the only child and heir apparent of perhaps England's most successful monarch, King Henry V. Henry had led the English to the brink of victory in the Hundred Years' War with their defeat of the French army at Agincourt. His reward was marriage to Catherine of Valois, the King of France's daughter, thus ensuring his male heir would be King of England and King of France. Whilst this did come to pass, Henry's heir was so ineffective and ill-suited to his role, his reign sparked one of the most famous periods of English history, known today as the Wars of the Roses. Since the arrival of William the Conqueror in 1066, England had been ruled by one family known as the Plantagenets. Now, nearly 400 years later, and cousins from that one family fought over who should be king. 
From 1455 till 1487, England descended into civil war as the family feuding became vicious battles. The worst of these was the Battle of Towton in 1461, known to this day as the largest and bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil. But a victor was apparent. Henry V's heir was deposed and a new king was crowned. King Edward IV would rule for nine tumultuous years and his two sons would become the princes in the Tower of London and disappear mysteriously, leaving the path clear for his brother to take the throne. The year was 1483 and the reign of King Richard III had begun. Welcome everybody to the outer fringes of the Fountains Abbey estate. And when I say outer fringes, I mean outer fringes. We're a good five miles from Fountains Abbey now. Now this is the start of the story, which is gonna take us to the very eve of the fall of the monasteries. And you might be wondering what that structure is right behind me. Well, that's known today as Howe Hill Tower. It was built around 1720, but it used the materials from a building which had stood there before, because it's around about 1200, maybe a little bit before that, a church was built here, because this was the center of a village, and that village was known as Earlshot. Now, before the monasteries arrived in England, before the golden age of the monasteries, really after the Norman conquest, so pretty much the period of time that we've covered in this series, all this land was owned by a local lord and everyone who lived on it would have worked for the lord and also paid him taxes. But as the monasteries arrived and their lands started to push outwards, it, it was actually because of the local landowners, because they would quite often gift land in the hope that that gift would help secure a place for them in the afterlife. So 70 years after Abbot Richard arrived here with his band of rebellious monks from York with absolutely nothing, their lands began pushing outward. And this village of Earlshot and all the land that surrounds here became part of the Fountains Abbey estate. This was a story actually duplicated at monasteries all across the country, driven by amazing people like St. Ored and also St. Godric at Finkel and also St. Hilda that we met at Hartlepool. The monastic culture had actually developed the first really efficient working practices because prior to this, nothing like this had quite existed because it's long before the time of factories. So if you think of a monastery as the monks who are doing the praying, the lay brothers who are doing the working to support that praying and to keep the monastery running, and all supported by the local lords who were all around the monastery, all giving donations, the overheads were absolutely minute. The problem was, monastic houses had nothing to spend what money they did have on anything other than buildings and their land. So their estates started to grow exponentially, and as their estates grew, more people were needed to work them. And it was the people of Earlshot and others like them who would become the new tenant farmers of Fountains Abbey's land. Now you may wonder how this happened, because there was of course the lay brothers, wasn't there? 
Well, around 1208 AD, monasteries across the country all started to realise they could not house enough lay brothers to manage their growing lands effectively. And after the Black Death killed off what lay brothers they did have, they were forced to employ tenant farmers to replace them. It was, though, a really difficult balance to dread because when the monasteries first arrived in England, they were revered and they were looked up to as the people who were going to secure a spiritual future for the population. But when those people that you're turning to for spiritual guidance are also the people collecting your rent, it changes the relationship a little bit, doesn't it? Now, we're just approaching and we're going to start walking along. It is something that so many visitors to Fountains Abbey don't realise because all around Fountains Abbey, for miles, going right the way around it in a big circle, are the walls which were built by the monks back in the 12th century to protect them and also to protect their tenants. This actually enclosed an estate of 70 acres. It contained all the abbey buildings, all the fields that they needed to be self-sufficient, and all the people that they needed to protect. And you might be wondering, why on earth did they need to do that? Well, we have to remember that until 1509, wolves roamed the forests and the fields of England. But it wasn't the wolves that caused the majority of the problems for the monasteries in the north of England. It was the Scottish that you needed to be particularly wary of. And it was from the north ahead of us that they came. Fountains Abbey and Revo Abbey were attacked many times by Scottish armies over the years, all fighting for independence. The worst attack took place in 1318, when both abbeys were badly burnt by marauding armies. But by 1483, the English armies, under their new King Richard III, had pushed the Scottish back behind their borders. They'd even taken control of the town of Berwick, which has actually stayed in English hands ever since. Now, what was life like at Fountains as the new King Richard III took the throne? Well, the last hundred years had been dreadfully hard. The plague had hit the community like an absolute thunderbolt around about 1348, and it had wiped out pretty much well, a, a huge proportion of the population. It wasn't just fountains though, it was the whole country. And the problem was that this meant there was nobody left to bring in the harvest. And then the problem was after that, that if you've got no one to bring in the harvest, you've got no one to put new crops in. And so fountains, and in fact the country, suffered year after year of terrible starvation. When you add to that fact the problems that we discovered at Mount Grace, a war with France for generations, the abbeys were controlled by France and so there was a deep distrust there. And then on top of that, the monks and the religious community as a whole told everyone that if you caught the plague, you were a sinner. Relations were most definitely at an all time low. So low in fact, that in 1385 and 1410, petitions were brought to Parliament to begin the dissolution of the monasteries. That, for me, is an absolute thunderclap of a revelation. I had no idea that this was the case. A hundred years before Henry VIII was doing any of his supposedly dastardly deeds, already there was a groundswell of support building in the country to drastically change the monastic communities. Thankfully, the monastic community at that time had an ace card. 
because the kings of England for hundreds of years had come from the same family line and they were known as the Plantagenets. So as long as the new King Richard III had a long and successful reign, what could possibly go wrong? As the new king got his feet under the table, and he was actually a local because he spent a lot of his time not far from Jervo Abbey, which we visited earlier on in the series. But as he got his feet under the table, Fountains Abbey got themselves a superb new abbot. His name was John Darnton, and he was absolutely loved by his community, probably for doing things like he did at Earl's shot that we've seen earlier on in today's episode. But whilst he was focusing outwardly on Fountains lands, he was also focusing inwardly. And his passion was all about returning Fountains Abbey to its former glory. So imagine we're a local lord riding out with our trusty manservant and we stop in at Fountains Abbey en route to our destination, Middleham Castle. And as we arrive at Fountains Abbey, what do we see? Let's go find out. Welcome everyone to the guest accommodation here at Fountains Abbey. Now, as we've discovered already a couple of times in this series, arrive at a monastery and you're always guaranteed a warm welcome. But of course, it does depend on how you arrive. It would always be a warm welcome, but if you arrive on foot, you'd be put up in a dormitory over in the main abbey buildings. Arrive on horseback like we have with a manservant and you'd be put up here. And let me tell you, this is absolutely tremendous. Most definitely accommodation fit for a king. There are two remaining guest houses at Fountains and they were built around 1160 AD by Abbot Richard III, who we met at the very end of the last episode in this series. What makes them particularly special is the fact that they're known today as the best surviving examples of 12th century domestic architecture in England. As we make our way to the smaller of the two guest houses, which is known today as the West Guest House, it's worth considering how large the accommodation is, even for today's standard. The ground floor consisted of one large hall and a wall fireplace. It would have provided accommodation for a husband and wife or a solo male traveller, but it would always have been used for visitors of great importance. When you consider that this spectacular set of buildings was completed in 1160, just 27 years after Fountains Abbey was formed in 1133, it shows you the meteoric rise of Fountains and its story across the country. Because if you needed to build guest houses like this, you must have had the guests who required them. So that shows us that the people who were coming to stay here at Fountains Abbey were of the very highest order indeed. We must remember though, that we've arrived one cold autumn evening in 1483. And at that time, these guest houses were 323 years old. Whilst they would have seemed a little worn and most definitely lived in, our host in 1483 is Abbot John Darnton, a man intent on returning fountains to its former glory. Throughout his abbacy, workmen, maybe from Earlshot, would be bustling all over the buildings, repairing stonework and ensuring everything looked its best. 
We've now made our way into the larger of the two guest houses to take a look at our bedchamber for the night, which would have been on the second floor. Now, it has sadly disappeared, but we would have found a bedroom, which was the height of sophistication, because it also had this private latrine, which discharged into the river scale below. So morning has come, we've had a great night's sleep in our spectacular accommodation, and we're making our way out. We're gonna to walk towards that abbey and see what we can see. And the first thing that would have been in front of us, and it would have been huge, was one of the many buildings at Fountains Abbey that lies underground, because right here, we're walking exactly where it was now. If I got some geophysics, you'd be able to see the outline of the building under the ground. It was a guest hall for the lesser people who'd arrived, maybe people who'd arrived on foot. This was sort of their equivalent of, of a dormitory, a bit like a sort of youth hostel it would have felt like. There's actually one tiny bit left, it's one of the pillars that's just here and this used to be one of the pillars that used to hold up the roof that ran down the middle of the great guest hall. But as we leave the guest hall behind, we wouldn't be able to help but notice as we arrive in the years that John Darnton was abbot here and he was returning fountains to all its glory, that the building would have been absolutely covered in workmen. After a hundred years of mismanagement and neglect, Abbot John had steadied the ship and now with the return of a good income, he set about upgrading the Abbey Church. Much of his work was to secure what was already here, but in the West End, ahead of us now, the rose window installed by Abbot Richard III, which had looked down on the main door for 323 years, had to be replaced. A new rose window was simply too expensive. And so Abbot John replaced it with windows that we would see in cathedrals that we visit today. They're called Lancet windows. Much cheaper, very beautiful, but nowhere near as striking as a rose window. Another thing that would be a really sort of glaring absence from Abbey life in 1483 was the distinct lack of lay brothers. By this time in history, they'd virtually disappeared. Once, they would have been everywhere. They had a cloister of their own. It's disappeared now, but it once stood right behind me. They had accommodation of their own. They even had a hospital and infirmary of their own. But now all that had gone. There was just a few lay brothers left. Now it would have felt more like a medieval town. It was full of men and women just commoners, normal men and women, who were paid to undertake the jobs that the lay brothers once took, and it kept the abbey running. There were many workshops and houses scattered all over the inner court. There was ironmongers and tanners and butchers all plying their trade and most lived here too. But there was one trade which sat at the very heart of Abbey life, and it had done since the beginning of Fountains Abbey's existence, and that was the production of cloth, and that was dealt with up here. Welcome everyone to Fountains Abbey's Wool House. Now this building was constructed in 1150 and it was built solely to provide habits for the monks of Fountains Abbey. But as the years progressed, it quickly became apparent to the community of Fountains that their cloth making capabilities could provide an income. And now in 1483, that income was helping empower Abbot John to restore Fountains Abbey and also take care of his tenants. We're walking through what was once a great aisle storehouse of four bays. Today it's reduced to low walling, but excavation has revealed it to be a complex structure which was once part of a massive range of buildings. Fleece was taken in and processed completely. It was spun into yarn then woven on a loom into cloth. At the centre of this complex was a huge fulling mill which felted the cloth to make it windproof and warm. 
Whilst the finished cloth would initially not have been dyed, by 1483 the wool house was also producing coloured cloth in circular dyeing vats to be bought by their tenant farmers. I think it's fair to say that life in these ancillary buildings at Fountains Abbey had most definitely changed since the, the start and the construction of the monasteries. Once these buildings were solely for the purpose of taking care of the community within Fountains Abbey, but now in these later years of Abbey life, these buildings were supporting the wider community as much really if not more than the monks who lived in fountains themselves. But what of those monks? How had life changed in the 351 years since Abbot Richard had first arrived here with his 12 rebellious monks from St Mary's Abbey? Let's go see what life was like. The first place that we're going to explore is the refectory. This is where the brothers used to dine. It was the dining room. Now we've seen lots of these throughout the series, but this one is absolutely spectacular. It's bordering on ostentatious, to be honest. There's so many amazing windows. Just take a look at this. And when I see you in part two, we'll discover the drastic change in diet that we would have found here in 1483 from those early days of Abbot Richard and his very first monks that came from St Mary's Abbey. We'll also take a walk up the steps to the pulpit where the brothers used to be read from. We've seen loads of those this series, but we've never been able to take a walk up the steps. And we'll also finish off the story of Fountains Abbey. So thank you so much for watching this first half and I'll see you later on in the show with more Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. What a start! Oh my goodness, what did you think of Earlshot? Amazing. It, it, do you know what? We drove past there so many times because we used to live near there years ago, about mm. 20 years ago. And we always wondered what it was. It was sort of fascinating because you'd go past it really quick and you'd to walk into it, you immediately knew. You could sort of see mm. in the earthworks, like in little roads going off to where there would have been houses. It's very hilly. Yeah. So the, the village was like sort of tumbling down the hill, coming down the hill. It was right around the hill. Wow. And what that tells you is it's a really old settlement because, of course, if you go back a long time, you built your settlements up high oh. so you could see any danger oh, yeah. coming. Right. So just... Amazing. That structure is so cool. Mm. I mean, granted, that structure was was built in 1720, but the, the stone that was mm. used, and you mm. can see it, you can see the stone is the stone from a church. And, you know, we'll never know how much of the original design of the church he followed. But I think it probably was fairly close because mm -hmm. it did have that sort of church-like feel. Yeah, it did. And I think, I suspect he probably wanted to pay and homage there's, to what there's it There's no, I mean, the, like the window things were all kind of bricked up, weren't they? I mean, is the entrance Metal. also... 
it was metal sheets oh, screwed right. oh, into the was frames. It? Yeah. And that's see, there's there's no way anybody could go in there. That whole place is owned by the National Trust. Oh. There's a sign as right. you walk into it. Permissive path, National Trust property. But which is brilliant. Yeah, it just made it safe for people to walk around. Well, I think it's brilliant that it is that because it's clearly a very important historic place. Mm. And so it's great in a way that there's not like cows all over it mm. or, you know, mm. that it's part of private land. What's so wonderful to think is that property was part of Fountains. It became then part of the Aisler Bees. Mm. And then it was then given to the National Trust. So it's never really been in like private farmland right unlike so much of hadrian's wall of course yeah yeah which you can still go along mm. but it's someone else's and it's mm. nice to think mm. that that's owned by all of us amazing great start oh my goodness fantastic what about those guest houses weren't they yeah, posh i know very posh and it's so weird because you know me and dan have been to fountains abbey so many times over the years not realizing what all these things were and you've now you know told me or, and told you all what all these things were. So the next time I go, it will have a lot more meaning to me because I'll know what, what actually happened in those spaces. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. All to come, though, second half. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So much more to see. The reconstruction, hopefully... Don't miss it. You're going to love it. It's yeah. going to be cool. Yeah. Right now, though, it's time for me to ask, Kay Jones, what's off your needles? I do have one thing off my needles, and it's a pair of socks. Yay! <laughs> What's so cool about this oh. is it couldn't be more sort no, of down. opportune because these are the socks which you were showing in the Sockoween trailer. That's right. Yes. So, yeah, we've totally redone and refreshed our double-pointed needle sock knitting series. And these are the socks that I knit whilst recording that series. So it's a shorty pair of socks. I've written a pattern for these, so you will get the PDF download attached to the first video. Uh, so you can print that off if you want to, or just follow along on your device. And knit yourself a pair of shorty socks using double pointed needles. So I loved knitting these, and I used some yarn that I dyed ages ago that I just found in my stash. And it actually was a bit of a an oops skein. It didn't come out as it should have. This is technically my serious colourway, but it just didn't, for whatever reason, it, it didn't dye up as it, as it normally does. So I, I put it in my stash and I thought I'd use it for scrappy projects and things like that. But it was perfect for this pair of socks because it's also slightly halloween isn't it? Sirius from Harry Potter. And it's, it's so the speckles have kind of knit up in a sort of quite random way. <laughs> but I don't mind that. It, it was perfectly lovely to use for this pair. So they're all, all finished and done. And a joy to knit. Just a joy. I loved, you know, I'm totally, totally back obsessed knitting with double points, I've got to say. Now, you said it's a, it's a refresh and I yeah. think it's, it's uh, disrespectful to this series to say that this is a refresh because <laughs> our DPN series, one of the first things we ever did when we started mm. Bakery Bear Productions, we started putting out, you know, tutorials to our patrons. Kay was already renowned for her sock knitting, so we produced some sock tutorial series mm, so these mm. were like years and years and years, years old ago. like mm. 2015 and my filming skills weren't great and Kay has honed her technique mm, and mm. her presenting skills dramatically yeah. so really this is the first time she's ever produced a beginner yes. sock knitting course yes. for dpns and yeah. the best part is if you think i'm not a dpn knitter and i want to do magic loop last sock queen she did a series on Magic Loop. I did. I so did. we've got Magic Loop or DPN, mm. so you can come and join in yes. with our Sokoween event. Absolutely you can. Yeah, it's so fun. And, yeah, I mean, these little shorty socks, they knit up so quick, and they don't use much yarn. I probably used about 50 grams of yarn, I think. I've still got all of this left. So I'm going to use that for something else. And, w and w what's been fun for me in the production process of these tutorials is we've just actually spent a lot of time redesigning our production of our tutorials yeah which people have sent us so many lovely mm, messages mm. and it's been so great but what i wanted to do for sokoween was give them a slightly seasonal twist so we've done that yeah. which is really exciting but yeah. also there's some bits in there that you've not seen 
where I've actually got some uh, pumpkins involved. And <laughs> right. So there's loads of sort of seasonal things going Brilliant. on right the way through. Because it's Sokoween, and it should be that way. Yeah, yeah, it should so be that way. So there's going to be lots of... I think what I'm trying to say is, even if you don't plan on maybe doing the DPN course and you're going to do the Magic Loop course, just have a little look mm. at the tutorial because I think you'll find it quite a sort of hallmarky seasonal. Yeah, there's there's six. Thankfully, there's no misunderstandings. There's no misunderstandings. And you don't fall in love with a hunk. Well, I did that some time ago. Oh, she's so. <laughs> hopefully, you mean me. <laughs> there's been no other hunks in my life. Let me tell you. Good. Um, yeah, so, the, so this this series as well is six parts. So it's really cool. So we start off and we cast on and we knit the rib. And then we do the leg where I talk about how to avoid ladders using double points. And then part three, we do the heel, tur heel flap and turn. Part four, we pick up the gussets and do the decreases. Part five, we're working the foot and I talk about... The, the length that your foot needs to be and how to work that out. And then part six is the toe and then the finishing. Beautiful. So really brilliant, very comprehensive series. So the series yeah. runs all through October, which yeah. is, of course, our Sokoween month. Yes. And now, thank goodness, it's time to return for one final time to Fountains Abbey to finish off the story of the rise of the monasteries. Welcome back everyone to the rise and fall of the monasteries and this is of course the refectory at Fountains Abbey. Now we've seen lots of refectories throughout this series but this one is by far the best. Throughout the life of Fountains Abbey the monks ate here and as we've discovered already in this series it was a meagre diet. Lots of vegetables, bread and fish were on the menu. The monks sat on two long tables to our left and right, with the abbot's table directly in front of us. Now, rather wonderfully, we can see in the bottoms of the walls some stone panels that used to come out that the tables used to be slotted up against. It stopped them moving from side to side. Just take a look at this. And you may remember that during mealtimes, the monks were read to from a pulpit it may be one of St. Ulred's books, or perhaps one of Bernard of Clairvaux's sermons. And for the first time this series, we can actually walk up the steps and take a look at the pulpit itself. Once in winter and twice in summer, Meals were taken here in the refectory and a reading was spoken from this spot. But gradually, as the years progressed, the diet became more and more lax. We're looking across at the site of the abbot's table. In 1335, it was officially sanctioned that meat could be served here to the senior monks of the abbey. This caused eruptions across the monastic community until finally in 1439, all the rest of the community were permitted to eat meat twice a week, but they weren't permitted to do it here. By 1483, Abbot John had constructed a second refectory here, known as the Misericord. And in its day, it was really quite sumptuous. Not much remains of it now, unfortunately, but rest assured that on the menu here were things rather more extravagant than what could be eaten in Fountains Abbey Refectory. Excavations done here in the 19th century found a rubbish pit outside the entrance to the Misericord, which contained bones, probably fresh from the table. There was beef, mutton, pork, venison, as well as oyster shells, mussel shells, and cockle shells. But surely, whilst the diet was richer, nothing else of the monastic way of life had changed, had it? So 
sadly, it seems it had. Whilst the monks still attended nine services a day, they no longer lived together in their dormitory. It all started around about 1170. Up until that time, abbots had lived with their brothers in the dormitory. But as the job of the abbot became more and more challenging and fundraising became more and more important, it was decided that the abbot should have his own house. And that created a simmering jealousy within the community that finally, by 1483, had seen the monks leave their dormitory, all sleeping together under one roof, and it had seen them move into another building, and that was right here. We're walking down the original monks' infirmary, but with the decline of the Lay Brothers, the infirmary moved to an abandoned lay building, and this space was converted into a series of private rooms. Over two floors with an aisle down the middle, private studies and bedrooms were provided, often with fireplaces. A similar conversion was made in the old dormitory. Thanks to the challenges of the last 100 years, monasteries now had space and so they used it. We see a similar story at all the places we've visited this series. What we're seeing here is such a change in the dynamic which brought the monastic culture to enormous power across all of England and all of Europe because when monasteries were first founded, their way of life was a challenge. People lived frugally and they ate frugally and life was extremely simple with very much one focus. But now, as hundreds of years had passed, human nature really, if you think about the jealousy related to the monks wanting privacy, just like the abbot had got, jealousy within the community itself had seen the community change. Monastic communities across the board changed like this and they became more lax. And that in turn led to jealousy and enviousness from the people who now worked for them. If you think about the residents of Earlshot, for example, who lived in such simple houses that not a trace of them remains, when they saw the lavishness of the life here being lived at Fountains Abbey, they can only have been jealous. But one thing remains sacrosanct, the activities that took place in Fountains Outstanding Church. Here, nothing had changed. 351 years may have passed since Abbot Richard and his community attended their first matins, but the services Abbot John now held were exactly the same. The only difference was the church itself was now a little bit more extravagant. Welcome back everyone to Fountains Abbey's spectacular church. The last time that we were here, it had just been burnt down by an angry mob keen to stop Abbot Henry Murdoch from becoming Archbishop of York. But now 300 years have passed and the opulence of this place would be plain for all to see. Abbot Richard III succeeded Henry Murdoch and he used the attack damage as an excuse to dramatically upgrade what had been a very simple church. Fountains Abbey, in fact all successful monasteries, had nothing to spend their wealth on but their buildings and their land. So as their lands expanded, their churches became more and more extravagant. Whilst this was at odds, at the core of the sort of Cistercian way of building churches and Cistercian teachings as a whole, when Abbot Richard III started his renovations at Fountains Abbey, the man who had written all those core principles of the Cistercian order had just died. And so liberties began to be taken, not just here, but at Cistercian monasteries across the world. 
Gone was the simple building with clean lines and not much decoration. And in came a vast, ornate building, far bigger than was needed, with finely cut ashlar masonry pieces. Now, we are of course walking through the nave, and this was once pretty much the home of the Lay Brothers. This is the, where they would come to meet for services twice a day. But by 1483, the Lay community had pretty much disappeared. The wooden pews which would have lined the walls down this wonderful nave were all removed, and instead it was a large space used by the monks on special feast days for processions. Now, I think it's fair to say that through this series, we have spoken quite a few times about the night stairs. I love them. It's where the monks used to process down at 3 a.m. every morning for matins. So they would come really sort of bleary eyed down the night stairs into the church for their first service of the day, which, as I said, is 3 a.m. The night stairs were just here. Now, whilst the night stairs at Fountains have long since disappeared, I thought for our final tour that it would be rather special if I tried to make this one final procession up through into the presbytery a little bit more unique, shall we say. So our journey starts at the top of the night stairs. We're actually using St Andrew's Church in Hexham as a reconstruction of Fintons Abbey Church and it's pretty much perfect because whilst St Andrew's survived the dissolution of the monasteries as a parish church, Fintons here of course did not. And just the, the, the presbytery in particular, it would have been so different here at Fintons because it would have been just covered with richly decorated wooden panels. None of them remain here at Fountains. At St Andrews, they remain in all their glory. By 1483, Fountains had relaxed its rules on burials here in the presbytery. And this space would have been just lined with wooden panels and, and spaces with burials of rich patrons. They would have paid handsomely for these burials in the hope of securing a place in the afterlife. Whilst none of those wooden side chapels remain here at Fountains, all we're left with are the stone walls of the church itself. Thankfully, at St Andrews, we get an unbelievable glimpse into what it would have felt like walking into one. There's one 
final image I want to share with you to try and get across the sheer awe-inspiring feeling these buildings would have once induced. Because if I was to take you back in time to 1483 and we were to come and stand here, just inside the north transept, our eyes would instinctively be drawn upwards to the amazing roof with its intricately carved wooden bosses flanked by stunning stained glass windows the sheer size of this building would have caused even a king to stop in his tracks and take in the view. standards had most definitely slipped in the 351 years since its foundation, with Abbot John Darnton in charge here at Fountains Abbey. The community hoped that they were entering a new golden age of monastic life, and with a Plantagenet King Richard III on the throne, they would always have the support at the highest levels of government. But there was a huge dark cloud on the horizon because little did Abbot John know that within just two years the Plantagenets would be out and a new royal line would be formed. We're entering the time of the Tudors and as one star rises another must fall. Thank you so much for watching and when I see you next time we'll be telling the story of the fall of the monasteries. I cannot quite believe it, but the rise of the monasteries is over. Mm. That is it. There is one episode left, but my goodness, we went out in style. What did you think of that reconstruction? Did you love it? I loved it. Wasn't it amazing? It was very much a something that came to me late on in the process. Yeah. So had I thought of it much earlier on, I perhaps would have shot the footage in Hexham a little bit differently mm. but I actually think that it really got across yeah, I, the intimacy but then also the grandness. Yeah yeah it absolutely did I thought it was brilliant because you, it's hard to imagine isn't it when you're walking around fountains for example it's really hard to imagine what it actually looked like you know all those hundreds of years ago and I find it really hard to comprehend that buildings like that existed when the rest of the country, the normal average person, was living in a very, very different way. Well, yeah, like the, the population of Earlshot, their houses were so basic that after yeah. the village was abandoned... It, it, they just fell down. It's disappeared. Yeah, and, that's and what every, yeah, a lot of people were living, like Dan said, in that very basic way. And then you see, can you imagine seeing that grandeur? You'd be like, what? Well, it, imagine it, working. Yeah, for yeah, them yeah. in that grandeur, and, that's and then going home to your hovel, little, you know, very basic you can wooden un house. Probably you can understand that perhaps there was, as we covered in in the episode, there was a, a, a certainly a, a feeling of jealousy, yeah, and all yeah, of these yeah. themes we will pick up on in the final episode in the series. The final episode is going to be unlike anything we've ever done before, mm, mm. on the grandest possible scale. And Very exciting. it's going to be bonkers. And it's a big story, but yeah. and also as well, in the final episode, we will be revealing what we're going to be doing next year. Oh, yes. So there's going to be no sort of wait. Pregnant pause whilst you wonder, OK, so Rise and Fall of the Monsters is finished. What's happened next? Yeah. Well, we shall find out. In, in, in Not next time, of course, because next time Kay is back mm. with the next part of My Favourite Blanket. Um, and indeed. it's the penultimate episode it of is. My Favourite Blanket. It's the, Nove it's the flower for November. Amazing. Yep. That'll be wonderful. And a few people have guessed, actually, right. what that flower might be. I'm not saying anything else. Amazing. Yeah. It's super pretty. Yes. Folks, oh my goodness, that's enough of that, because right now it's time for the Endy Bits. Endy Bits! <laughs> 
So, already mentioned the next patron only show coming yep. up on Sunday, the 24th of September at 2 pm British summer time. So, don't miss that. It's mm-hmm. our Soccer Queen launch event. Yes. Also, as well, don't miss our radio show next week when I'll be giving you my <gasps> full review of Pride and Prejudice. <sighs> And you can listen to our last show right now, which was all about our garden adventures. And I've put a link in the show notes so you can go and listen to that if you'd like to. Mm-hmm. And we've had lots of people messaging us, actually, and giving us yeah. lots of cool gardening tips. Brilliant. Like sticking vinegar on your slabs to stop them getting slippy. Ah, oh. white vinegar, like... Clean, does everything. It does everything, cleans everything, yes. doesn't it? Yeah. You bought some stuff. I bought, well, just one thing I've got to show you that I've bought. Ooh, it's, nice. it's very nice. And I want to cast this on. I can't possibly cast on another pair of socks, can I? What is going on? But I was on Wool Warehouse recently. I was just buying a few embroidery threads. And I always go and have a look at what's new in yarn, because who doesn't? And I saw this yarn and I thought, oh, that looks interesting. I'm going to have to buy a skein and do a review of it and knit with it. And it's sock yarn. And amazingly, it's by Knit Pro, who make the needles. And it's called Knit Knit Pro Symphony. Well, it says Knit Pro Symphony, and then underneath it says Terra, which is like, means earth, doesn't it? Or ground, yeah. And it's a 75-25. I deliberately got one that was variegated to see how that knit up. So I'll show you the on. It's super pretty. Look, how lovely is that? It's really soft. So you get... It's at 75.25 and you get, for 100 grams, you get 380 metres, which is 415 yards. And I mean, it looks lovely. This colourway is called Summer Romance. I have a feeling, looking at it in the skein like that, that it it could well do like one of those stripey things. You know, like where it swirls. But I thought I would open it up. I haven't opened up the skein. I deliberately left it because I thought we'd open it up together and have a look at the skein. And then I should be able to, to work out from that what I how I think it's going to knit up. Maybe it'll surprise me. Actually, it's not quite how I thought. Let's get it even on my hands. So you've got... Can I be honest? Yeah. I think it's going to be a problem. I Well, it's funny because, look, on this side here, can you see we've got white with speckles and then opposite side we've got green and then surely your spidey senses are like clanging yeah i I because you know i filmed a lot of reviews in my time and when i I see yarn like this look at this bit for example so this half this half of the skein is white and this half of the skein is green so that I'm wondering if actually both socks would knit up entirely differently, judging by that. Because usually what you find with hand-dyed yarn, let's take, you know, a plain section. Let's take this green section, for example. Is you will find that there'll be a chunk, or you can find. This is not how it's always dyed. But if it's going to do something naughty when it knits up, you'll find that, like, it's dyed in sort of chunks. So you might get a chunk here that was green, for example, and then moving on, you might get a chunk here that was another colour or was speckled, and then another chunk that was another colour. Those are the ones that I tend to look out for because I feel like those are the ones that are most likely to pull. This looks sort of different. I mean, I'm kind of interested. Hard to tell, but I do get the feeling it might knit up a little bit naughty. If you like say. eclectic, this but I'm, could I'm be really the yarn interested. for you. Well, I'm really interested to see how it's going to knit up. And I will knit with this. All will be revealed. Yeah, so we shall see. But it's pretty colours. You know, I love that shade of green. And Brian is massively into green at the moment. Sage green is her current favourite. So we'll see how that knits up. I think it'll be interesting. Anything else? Yes. I'm going to show you the yarn we're going to use for Sockerween. Cool. So I've got a skein each. So the one that Dan's going to use is one that I dyed up, actually, for my favourite colourways, I think, last year, maybe. And this one is a ha- another Harry Potter colourway, and it's called After All This Time. So it's a Snape reference. And it's this. I mean, how perfect is this for Halloween? So it's a really dark grey with, you know, black, but then you get little pops of like slightly neonish. Can you see, it's difficult to see. As I turn it, can you see here? There's like yellow and pink and blue up here. So it's gonna knit up so nice. And I think with the whispers in the walls, it'll be a really spooky looking pair of socks. Cool. So I'm really jealous that Dan's gonna knit with that. 
And then for me, I've had this yarn since last year. I bought this last sort of September, October, and I didn't knit it because it had gone a little bit past October by then, I think. And I thought, no, I'm going to save it. So I'm going to use this one. So it's from Pixie Yarn, and it's called Halloween Rainbow. And it's a micro stripe. So do you know where you just get those sort of one or one and a half rows or whatever stripes? And it's all of the Halloween colours. So we've got like oranges, burnt oranges, reds, purples, a sort of more pumpkin orange, a greeny yellow and black. So I think it's going to be so cool. And I think I'm going to knit my hobbity socks, which again is quite kind of autumnal Halloween, isn't Definitely. it? The Hobbity Socks was a pattern I put into Knitability from last Christmas. So it's been it's been a really popular pattern with our patrons. I've seen it knit up so many times and it looks fantastic with self-striping. And this one is a micro stripe, so I'd be really interested to see how it's going to knit up. So that's our two Sockerween yarns. Cool. And then the final thing I wanted to show you is just the prizes that I've got for the self-striping knit along. So I've got these two lovely yarn sets, sock sets, from Fab Funky Fibres. These were donated very kindly to the show. So I'm using these as prizes. They're both rainbow themed. So you get two 50 grams and then a 20 gram contrast. So I've got two sets of those. Beautiful. For two prizes. And then we had a donation from a lovely viewer of this amazing yarn, which is from um, Shopple, Shopple Wall. It's like a Zauber ball. It's called, I can't say it, it's that. And it's like a set of minis, Zauber ball type minis, which I think is fantastic. Amazing. So that's going to be a prize too. And then Perfect. we've also got a couple of skeins that are going to be donated from Carrie at Freckled Whimsy, but she'll be sending those directly to the winner. So altogether, we've got five prizes. Can't wait. Cool. <laughs> Folks, that's it. Oh my goodness, what a show. Amazing rise and fall of the monasteries. Some wonderful projects. Yep. Also some extremely dodgy looking yarn. I don't I mean, I need to, I really, really want to cast this on. Maybe I'll just cast it on just so I can see how it knits up. So folks, that's it. Oh my goodness. We'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode of My Favourite Blanket. Yes. But oh my goodness, don't miss our patron exclusive show coming up on Sunday. Yeah. There'll be lots and lots of Sockerween fun. Plus we'll actually be talking a little bit about reviews on there as well. Yes. So don't miss that. So we'll see you then. See you soon, everybody. Bye. 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 Not quitting for men and cable bakery pairs. They'll take you to fabulous places of which their favorites they'll share. You better buy a pad and get yourself a bakery pair. You'll find yourself in a castle while watching the bakery pairs. It never feels like a hassle.